This is going to be the next part in the series of God's Game of Thrones. And now we're going to look at the kings of Israel and Judah, starting with Rehoboam. So this is King Rehoboam. First, I'm going to give you a quick description of this king. So his name, Rehoboam, it means enlargement of the people. He's Judah's first king, but he briefly ruled all 12 tribes. The references for Rehoboam are 1 Kings 12, 1 through 24, 1 Kings 14, 21 through 31, and 2 Chronicles 10 through 12. Now his spiritual state, he started evil, does good three years, and then ends evil. He reigns 17 years during the reign of Jeroboam. His parents are King Solomon and Naamah and Ammonitus. The prophets that prophesied during his time is Shemaiah and Ahijah. Now he's notorious for dividing the kingdom into two. And that's why he only briefly ruled all 12 tribes for a brief time because he's notoriously known for dividing the kingdom into two. And he would be king over the southern kingdoms, Judah and Benjamin, and the other 10 tribes would make up the northern kingdom and Jeroboam would rule over those. Like his uh, father and grandfather, he multiplied wives. He had 18 wives and three score concubines. So he was a lover boy, just like his daddy Solomon. He picked up some bad habits. His strong attributes, he's got some strong attributes. You'll notice that he's humbled by preaching. You'll notice that he's the son of Solomon. So this is going to give him uh, some things that come on into his reign, which is connections to a lot of people and things like that, just from being the son of Solomon. He will picture someone who chooses to serve the flesh, the world, and the devil. He's a picture of that. And Rehoboam dies at the young age of 58. Now, let's look at Rehoboam's enemy, which would be King Jeroboam. Now, here's some background on Jeroboam. We'll be doing a whole lesson on him in the next one. But here's a little bit of background on him. Jeroboam is a mighty man of valor who Solomon, Rehoboam's father, made ruler over all the house of Joseph. And Ahijah the prophet is told to tell Jeroboam that he would be king over the ten, uh, ten of the tribes. And this causes Solomon to be after the life of Jeroboam. So Jeroboam flees to Egypt until the death of Solomon. Now, with that brief description of King Rehoboam, let's talk about Rehoboam and his setup for failure. What are some of his setups for failure? Number one, his father's choices. His father, King Solomon, made some horrible choices. Now, someone doesn't automatically fail because of the choices of their parents. However, these choices can certainly push them in the wrong direction. Rehoboam ends up causing the kingdom be, to be split, but Solomon is the one who had them close to the edge and at the tipping point. He raised taxes, and he also let his heart stray from the Lord because of his wives. So Rehoboam grew up seeing Solomon multiply wives. He, he grew up seeing Solomon live for the flesh. He grew up and seen Solomon worship other gods. He may have uh, read Solomon's Proverbs and the songs that he wrote, but his life wasn't lining up with a lot of the things he wrote. Now, 1 Kings 11, 3 through 8, and he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. This is talking about King Solomon. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, 
the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all of for all his strange wives, which burn incense and sacrifice unto other gods and unto their gods, so we are pushing our children towards failure when we forsake the Lord in our lives. What's in your hands around your son? A Bible or a video game controller? What's in your mouth around your son? Praise or profanity? Psalms and spiritual songs or the latest song of fools? Are you going around singing the latest country song that's a complete song of fools? The latest rap song? What's catching your eye in front of your son? His mother or someone else's wife? Sons want to be like their fathers. Solomon's actions put Rehoboam in line for failure. And even though Solomon had wise words, your walk will talk louder than your talk. Rehoboam was a setup for failure because of his father's choices. And if you read about Solomon, you'll see why. Next, Rehoboam was a setup for failure because Rehoboam forsook wise counsel. In Proverbs 1, 5, it says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. And you know who wrote this as the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam didn't keep this proverb. In 1 Kings 12, 1, it says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. So who are you making king? Who sits on the throne of your heart? Donald Trump or the Lord Jesus Christ? Joe Biden or the Lord? Who are you making king? Are you all into politics and you think the answer to everything is who is president? Or do you believe Jesus Christ is king of kings and he's the only one that can bring peace to this world and into your heart? It says in 1 Kings 12, 2, and it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. So remember, Jeroboam's hiding out because he was afraid of Solomon because Solomon wanted him dead. Now verse 3 and 4, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. So notice that Solomon had already pushed this kingdom to the edge. He raised taxes. He had put a heavy yoke on the people. And they're coming to Rehoboam saying, Make it lighter on us. Make it easier than your father had it on us. And here's what he says in 5 and 6. Rehoboam says, And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do you advise that I may answer this people? One good thing about Rehoboam is that he did seek counsel from the old men first. He did have enough sense to do that, to seek counsel from them first. It says, And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. That was the advice from the old men. But verse 8 says, But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. You're setting yourself up for failure, when you forsake wise counsel. Older men, even lost old men many times, as a general rule, have more wisdom through experience 
than the young men, and especially the advice you can get from a godly old man is priceless. But Rehoboam forsakes this wisdom. He could have been a hero of the faith and had his name in Hebrews 11. His father didn't even get in there. His, uh, Solomon didn't even get in there. So Rehoboam, he forsakes wise counsel. If an older man can show you sound biblical counsel, then you should take it. Don't forsake wise counsel. Or you're going to set yourself up for failure. Next, Rehoboam set himself up for failure, not only because of his father's choices, forsaking wise counsel, but also because of his friends list. You're going to see that Rehoboam was hanging out with the wrong crowd. He takes the advice from people on his friends list. He gets them in a group chat, and each one gives their opinion on what they think he should do. 1 Kings 12, 8, But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. So many times a young man will take the advice of his gamer friends over his own mother and father. He will take the advice of a young teacher at his school who isn't even much older than he is. He'll take his advice over his grandmother. He will take the advice of a Facebook post over the advice of his pastor. 1 Kings 12, 9. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people, who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which the father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spoken to him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So their advice is to make the people even more mad than they were before. The young man is young men's advice is to make it harder on the people than Solomon already had it. And it says in verse 12, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Rehoboam is going to make their yoke heavy. And a, a yoke, you know, it's a piece of wood that would connect two oxen together while they worked. He's going to make their yoke heavy. And at least Rehoboam is honest. Unlike politicians today. They say everything is going to be peachy and they're just going to make everything so much better and make it easier on you. And they're just lying like a dog. I mean, Ray Bum's not even a, being a good politician here. He's just telling them he's going to make it harder on them. Serving under Ray Bum is like serving the devil as a slave to sin. You're born with a sin problem. And when you choose to serve the devil, it will only make things worse. It will add to your yoke. The sinful life is a heavy load. Um, Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The heavy load of a sinful life is weighing you down. It's like serving Rehoboam. He's adding to your yoke. He's making it grievous. So serving Rehoboam is the opposite of serving Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ said in Matthew eleven thirty, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Serving Jesus Christ will give you rest. Serving the flesh, the world, and the devil just makes your yoke heavy. 1 Kings 12, 15, Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord. 
It was from the Lord that this was going to happen, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Ahijah the Shilonite told Jeroboam beforehand that he was going to get ten of the kingdoms. And if Rehoboam had twelve, then he wouldn't get ten. So you're going to see that Rehoboam, because of this, splits the kingdom. And they rebel against him. And ten of them go to Jeroboam, and he keeps two of them. So Ahijah had already predicted that the kingdom would be split, and Jeroboam would get ten tribes, and Rehoboam would have Judah and Benjamin. So you see that Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men. He had people on his friends list that gave him the wrong advice. Instead of being kind to the people, he made them hate him. And James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypo hypocrisy. Rehoboam doesn't have these qualities. He's like a rich kid trying to be tough. He is what causes the kingdom, kingdom to be divided. So instead of Israel being one, they are broken down into the southern kingdom, Judah and Benjamin, and the northern kingdom, the other tribes. 1 Kings 12, 16 and 17. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed into their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. And this is only for David's sake that this happened. It's only for David's sake that Rehoboam got to reign over them. But now you're going to see that Rehoboam even has the nerve to still send his tax collector to the people after what just happened. In verses 18 through 20, Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. And it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So it isn't a surprise that so many men would follow Jeroboam because he was a mighty man of valor. He probably got the attention of the people by his warrior-like credentials and how he looked similar to Saul. And the people followed him. 1 Kings twelve twenty one. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Notice Rehoboam's friends from the tribe of Benjamin. They were considered to be one of the more filthy tribes, and many of them were sodomites. However, they were tough as nails, They and they weren't worried about breaking a nail even though they were sodomites. In the book of Judges, Benjamin took on Israel by himself. So they weren't worried about, you know, getting their clothes dirty. Uh, they, were a, they were a tough tribe, they, and they were m one of the more filthy tribes. The people that Rehoboam associates, him, associates himself with is one of his downfalls. So Rehoboam has Judah and Benjamin. Even though this is only two tribes, they would have taken out the other ten tribes because of he had Benjamin. However, God sends another preacher. In 1 Kings twelve twenty two through 24, it says, But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, You shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. 
They hearkened therefore to the word of the Lord and returned to depart according to the word of the Lord. Notice Rehoboam's reaction to the preaching was a good reaction. He listened to the preacher. He was a bad man, but he listened. And a lot of pe lost people are like that. They live like the devil, but they know that the preacher is right. Now let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 14 and just see how bad of a guy Rehoboam actually was. Rehoboam had a lot of light. Even though Solomon, his father, turned away from the Lord in front of him, Rehoboam's dad was still the wisest man who ever lived and spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Rehoboam's grandfather was the mighty King David. Rehoboam was a complete failure. He was set up for failure through his father's choices, through forsaking wise counsel, his friends list, and now we're going to see he sets, him up, sets himself up for failure through his filthy practices. 1 Kings 14.21 And Rehoboam the son of Solomon reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was forty and one years old when he began to reign. And he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama and Ammonitus. Now remember that the Ammonites, his mother was an Ammonite, and they came about because of a drunken incest relationship between Lot and his daughters after coming out of Sodom. So Rehoboam's mama was probably a wild thing, probably similar to Megan the Stallion, Cardi B, and Nicki Minaj. So Solomon, his father, really knew how to pick them. I mean, he was picking them up at the club or something. Everyone he got with was the kind you don't bring home to mother. I mean, I bet he was lucky if she even made him a cheese sandwich. Uh, Solomon said he couldn't find a virtuous woman. He was looking in all the wrong places. He was getting the strange woman who worshipped other gods. And you can't put a price on a godly woman. Uh, godly women are better than men. Even, I mean, the most spiritual you peep, most spiritual people you see are godly women, and that's what you see in churches today. You mostly see godly women. The men today don't uh, even want to have anything to do with God or the Bible. They're lazy. They're selfish. But uh, the churches are filled with godly women who can't even get their husband to come many times. If you're a woman that reads the Bible and prays and tries to do right, then you're one of the greatest Christians. And it's the men that should be leading the house. It's the men that should love the Bible and be guiding their wife and their children in their home. But as a general rule today, women are better Christians than men. That's what you see in churches. You mostly see spiritual women that have deadbeat husbands and it's very rare that it's the other way around. 1 Kings 14, 22, When Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins, which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. So Judah did evil. They provoked, provoked God to jealousy. He is a jealous God. Jealousy is a characteristic of God. It isn't always a bad thing. And he was jealous because in verse 23 it says, For they also built them high places and images and groves on every aha hill and under every green tree. So they would go up there in these high places and worship false gods in these groves and under the shades of the trees because men like to do evil in the shadows. Then when it gets real bad, they come out with it in the open. You know, it's getting real bad when you parade your wickedness in broad daylight. It's getting real bad when the music videos are like pornography and come on in the middle of the day. It's getting real bad when the commercials show two men kissing and when the cartoons push a satanic sodomite agenda. 1 Kings 14, 24, And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So there was 
sodomites left in the land. Rehoboam was being soft on the sodomites. And you'll find later on that the good kings actually drive the sodomites out of the land. Because, you know, they want to reproduce. They, don't, they can't reproduce, so they, they got to uh, teach people their ways. They teach people their sinful ways. So then they recruit people. And they got to get them soft towards that sin. And that sin is so unnatural that you have to brainwash people into accepting it most times. You have to make it seem sweet and innocent. And that's exactly what they're doing today on the TV shows, trying to make sodomy sweet and innocent, trying to make you think that oh, it's just love, but it's not. 1 Kings fourteen twenty five through 26, And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. If you've been a Bible student for a while, then you've probably heard how Egypt is a type of the sinful world in the scriptures. And Rehoboam has been living for the world. Now what you're seeing with Shishak, king of Egypt, and Rehoboam, what you're seeing is how the world will take away your treasures. Shishak comes in and he takes away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. If you're a Christian, then your mind should be on Jesus Christ. It should be on heaven. It should be on the judgment seat of Christ. You're supposed to be setting up treasures in heaven. As it says in Matthew six nineteen through 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So the same way Rehoboam allowed Shishak, the king of Egypt, a type of the world to take away your treasures is the same way Christians allow the world to take away their treasures. In Revelation, Paul tells us it is possible for someone to take that crown. In his little epistle, John talks about how it is possible to lose your reward. Paul tells us that we can suffer loss. You can allow this world, the flesh and the devil, to ruin the judgment seat of Christ for you. It says in verse 27 of 1 Kings 14, And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields. So in the place of those golden shields that Solomon made, he, makes, he puts brazen shields in their place and committed them unto the hands of the chief of the guard which kept the door of the king's house. So in place of the golden shields, you would think Rehoboam would at least get some silver shields. However, he went down even another notch further to brazen shields. And each generation will generally get worse and have less standards than the last generation. And you have a group of people called the recovering fundamentalists of today. They grew up in a strict environment under hardcore IFB parents and pastors. And while that environment could be too strict because of convictions that aren't even in the Bible, the modern churches today can be too slack. The danger in that is the slacker you are, the more slack your kids will become. The more you, the more uh, edgy things you accept, the more edgy things your kids are going to accept. And if this generation today says, uh, I'm going to go ahead and use the modern versions. Even though my parents was King James only. I'm going to go ahead and use the modern versions. Your kids are going to take that even further. Uh, you say, I'm going to uh, listen to the contemporary Christian music. When your kids get older, they're going to be having uh, secular music in church. And I mean, you already see that a little bit today where I think it's Charles Stanley's son. They just go ahead and play secular music in church. I mean, whatever you, you do, your kids are going to take it even further. 
they're going to take it down another notch. And their kids are going to take it down another notch. And if you're going to just say, well, my parents were so strict, uh, I'm going to go ahead and be a little bit more slack than that. Well, your kids are going to be even more slack than that. Whatever you do, remember your kids are going to be even worse. So, I mean, I would rather be too strict than too slack. There's a balance. I mean, you don't want to be like certain old IFB uh, pastors and parents who uh, were too strict or even what they call a new IFB have some weird beliefs and could, it could have convictions that aren't even in the Bible. And you don't want to be um, like the modern people of the of mega churches who are too slack. You want to be a Bible believer. Now, if you're a Bible believer, you're not identified by old IFB, new IFB. You're not just a fundamentalist. You don't just believe in the fundamentals. You believe the Bible. You're a Bible believer. And you're not just in bondage to, to the traditions of men. And you're not in bondage to convictions that aren't even in the Bible. You let the Bible lead you. And the Bible gives you liberty. But at the same time, it's not slack. It doesn't teach you to be slack. But so you don't want to be... Um, you don't want to go too far one way and be so so hard and uh, strict that you add convictions to people that aren't even in the Bible. And you don't want to go, go the other way and be one of these recovering fundamentalists and be too slack. The best thing to do is just preach and teach the book. Don't add unnecessary standards. And at the same time, don't drop all the standards. If you just grab the Bible and preach it and teach it, God will take care of the rest. The problem is none of these groups teach the Bible hardly at all. The strict old IFB spent too much time on standards and convictions. The modern day churches spend all their time singing and getting people hyped up and trying to be popular with the world, using the modern versions of the Bible and bashing the old school guys that were too strict for them you'll find that uh, the recovering fundamentalists are just as judgmental as the old school people of the IFB. The old school people of the IFB may have been judgmental of people, but the recovering fundamentalist crowd are just as judgmental. They spend all their time bashing old gospel preachers. That's something weird there. When all your time... When your ministry, your podcast is bashing the old guys, that's weird. Why wouldn't you make a ministry bashing the music industry or the entertainment industry or something? I mean, that's the enemy. Your enemy is not other Christians. Your enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. So why would your whole podcast be about bashing old preachers or current preachers. That's weird. So they're both wrong in many ways. Sometimes the old school guys were adding convictions that weren't in the Bible. And now these new guys, they got, they have no standards. Anything goes. But just to remember, the more slack you are, your kids will get even slacker. And I'm not saying to be overly strict. You can have standards and convictions, but you also have to have liberty too. There is no need to add standards and convictions that aren't even in the Bible. And there is no need to abuse your liberty as an act of rebellion against the old, older uh, preachers and pastors from days gone by. 1 Kings 14, 28 through 31. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. That's those shields. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he, that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? 
And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus. And Abijam his son reigned in his stead. Now notice that the rest of the acts of Rehoboam are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So let's go there. And so we're going to go to the Chronicles and go over the same material again, but it's going to add some more stuff. So it's going to we're going to start looking at Rehoboam again, and it's going to cover a, a, a lot of the same material, but also adds more nuggets in there. So and notice in Second Chronicles, we're going to go to Second Chronicles after Rehoboam listens to the preaching of Shemaiah, he starts building and fortifying strongholds. So we're back before Rehoboam dies. It's going back and talking about Rehoboam again. Second Chronicles 11, 4 through 12. Thus saith the Lord, You shall not go up nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. Remember how we talked about how Rehoboam listened to the preacher. So it says he obeyed the words of the Lord. And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. He even built Bethlehem and Ed Edom and Tekoa and Bethzer and Shoko and Adullam and Gath and Marisha and Ziph and Adoram and Lachish and Azekah and Zorah and Ajalon and Hebron, which are in Judah and in Benjamin fenced cities. And he fortified the strongholds and put captains in them in store of victual and of oil and wine. And in every several city he put shields and spears and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. So there, there's nothing wrong with building and fortifying like Rehoboam is doing. There's nothing wrong with getting prepared. Just don't let any physical thing have more of your trust than God himself. It's good to prepare, but just always remember it. It's God that's going to keep you safe. It's God that's going to protect you. I'm trying to stay prepared in my Christian life. When I mark up my Bible, I see it as preparing for war. When I make references in my Bible, I see it as fortifying strongholds. That way, when a false doctrine or a satanic cult comes your way, you've got the verses. I've got five smooth stones for them. I've got a sharp two-edged sword. Second Chronicles eleven eleven, and he fortified the strongholds, and put captains in them, and store of victual and of oil and wine. In the last days of the church age that me and you are in, I'm not storing physical weapons to preserve my physical life, but I'm making a library. I've got Bibles, I've got preaching galore, I've got teaching. I collect Bible believing books and articles. And these will help you in your fight against spiritual wickedness in high places, against the false teachers of this world. A lot of times people ask if they can donate to me, and I always tell them, uh, don't ever feel like you have to pay me back for giving you some truth. Because Proverbs twenty three twenty three says, Buy the truth and sell it not. Also, wisdom and understanding. Instruction and understanding. You know that verse, Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. The purpose of my ministry is to put out as much truth as I can for free so that anybody can get it. And if you want to help me, if you really want to help me, just get me a gift certificate or something from the Bible Baptist bookstore or something. But don't ever feel like you have to give me money and for me to, in exchange for the truth. The purpose is for me to put out truth as quickly as possible and make it accessible to everybody. That's the goal of this, is to put the truth out, get people interested in the Bible. And I've, I'm fortifying strongholds. I'm building something. I'm building up my library. I'm making all these studies getting notes in my Bible. That way, whatever topic comes up, I've most likely done a study on it. I already have notes on it. And see, you forget things over time. 
a lot of the studies I've done, I can't remember all that I had to learn for each study. But if I've still got the study written out or in my Bible, I can just look back at it. And it makes a defense. It's a defense against false doctrine and the wickedness going on. So that helps me fortify strongholds, what like Rehoboam's doing. When, Re when Rehoboam was doing right, he had men who wanted to do right come and be under his leadership. They wanted to come and be under him. They didn't want to be under Rehoboam anymore. You'll see in Second Chronicles eleven thirteen through 16, And the priests and the Levites that were in all Israel resorted to him out of all their coasts. For the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem. For Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord, and he ordained him priests for the high places and for the devils and for the calves which he had made. And after them out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah, and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So there is strength in numbers if those numbers are on the Lord's side. And they did walk in the way of David for three years. They did ride a little while. Three, three years is about all you get out of a lot of people. But notice that when Rehoboam was doing right, it made good men want to come his way. Notice that the wives of Rehoboam, uh, the wives of Rehoboam are also part of the family of David, just like he was. So he's keeping things in the royal bloodline. You'll see in Second Chronicles eleven eighteen, and when and Rehoboam took him, Mahalath, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, to wife. So not only was Rehoboam from David, it went David, Solomon, Rehoboam. He was taking uh, wives that came from David. Maalath, the daughter of Jeremoth, the son of David, to wife. And Ab 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 Abihel, the daughter of Eliab, the son of Jesse, which bare him children, Jaius and Shemariah and Zaham. And after her, he took Maacah, the daughter of Absalom. Once again, Absalom was another one of David's sons. So he took to wife Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, which bare him Abijah, and Atiah, and Ziza, and Shelemith. And Rehoboam loved Maacah, the daughter of Absalom, above all his wives and his concubines. For he took eighteen wives and threescore concubines, and begat twenty and eight sons and threescore daughters. And Rehoboam made Abijah the son of Mecca the chief to be ruler among his brethren, for he thought to make him king, and he dealt wisely and dispersed of all his children throughout all the countries of Judah and Benjamin, unto every fenced city, and he gave them victual in abundance, and he desired many wives. So he desires many wives. Men follow their daddies. David and Solomon both multiplied wives, even though they weren't supposed to. So Rehoboam ends up multiplying wives as well. It says in Second Chronicles 12, 1, And it came to pass, when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. That's a setup for failure. What are his setups for failure? His father's choices. He forsook wise counsel. He had filthy practices. He had a bad friends list. And he forsook the law of the Lord. Now he starts to stray. After those good three years, he strays. And we're back to the story of Shishak, king of Egypt, coming against him. In 2 Chronicles 12, 5 through 8, Then came Shemaiah, the prophet to Rehoboam, and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak, and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. 
Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and the service of the kingdoms of the countries. Now look at verse 12. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in, in Judah things went well. So, so King Jeroboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama, an Ammonitus, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Notice that Rehoboam did humble himself under the preaching of the word again. You'll notice that that is a big difference between him and Jeroboam. Rehoboam would be humbled by preaching. Jeroboam would not. Rehoboam spent a lot of time preparing himself against an enemy, a physical enemy, but not enough time preparing himself spiritually. Today, we do both of those at the same time because our enemies are spiritual enemies. And the physical enemies we have, we don't fight them. We try to love them to the Lord Jesus Christ. We fight our physical and spiritual battles spiritually because it's the Word of God, it's prayer that's going to prepare us for both of those things. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We don't use physical weapons. And we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. The physical battles we go through with people, those people are led by spirits. And we prepare against them, spiritually speaking, with the Bible. But this has been a study on King Rehoboam. Next time we're going to look at King Jeroboam and how he resembles the Antichrist.